how many, uh, this is a question to the women in the room. How many of you uh, are living with somebody, married to somebody, have a son who has selective spousal hearing syndrome? Well, the good news is this morning, we thought about passing out samples, but we knew, you know, there was that whole FDA thing and all that. So, um, how many of y'all have had coffee this morning? We ground up a little bit and we put it in the coffee just to see. It's kind of a pastor test thing. So, no, seriously, guys, I apologize, but um, I are one. I suffered uh, and continue to suffer through selective spousal listening syndrome. And I knew that you would want to come clean with me, right? We are weak. We are weak men. And if something looks pretty, tastes pretty, or if it has shiny buttons and is a remote, we're just gone, right? There was a whole huddle of men around the uh, 65-inch screen TV out here this morning trying to figure out if they could just, you know, outbid each other by five bucks. But, so here's the deal. Um, We started with a joke. But this is going to go deeper now. Uh, We're really kind of in a mess. We're just going to have kind of a heart-to-heart here, okay? I wish this was more of a conversation than a sermon because um, I know you join me in wanting to be different than you are. You know, uh, Daniel started the Sticks and Stones worship series last week by talking to us about how important it is to just do this one basic simple thing breathe. If you were here last week, I hope you took that to heart. I hope this week as you found yourself just waking up, you breathed with all the different allergens in the air. You know, it's amazing any of us can, but I, uh, maybe you were stuck on 35. Maybe you were uh, delayed at the airport by one of the many storms that came through. Maybe your son or daughter or husband or wife came home with news that didn't land pleasantly on your ears. Was your first response to go, I hope so. You know, it's kind of funny, this this sermon series. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will. Isn't that the craziest thing you ever heard of? What kid or what parent ever wrote that thinking there's an ounce of truth in that? Has anybody here ever been wounded by a word? Oh my goodness, yeah. We know good and well that Words have sharp edges. It's like under the basketball hoop, people throwing elbows, right? Words hurt. At the very least, they bruise. They can destroy lives. We know that they can destroy careers. We see it right and left. And they certainly can bring any of us to tears or to just a no good, horrible, very bad day, right? And then you turn the template over and you look at our world today. Um, We're in a world hurt. Wouldn't you agree? I think in part it is because we have lost at its very core what it means to sit and have a conversation with somebody, to listen. Friends, one of the things I want you to kind of plant in your brain today is this little phrase, hearing is involuntary, but listening is a choice. Sound waves hit your ears and my ears right and left all day long. From the moment we open our eyes to the moment we fall asleep, some of us can't even fall asleep in the quiet. We have to have on white noise or the television or the radio or Pandora. But it is when we truly want to know information that we do what? That we listen. I'm making an assumption. And the assumption is that you are in this room because you have testified that you are a follower of Christ. Well, friends, it is time this morning that we flip that word And as followers, we need to become leaders. We need to become leaders in new and different and better ways to not hear, but to listen. We have a great text this morning. If you have your Bible, whether it's on your phone or in the app or whichever way you hear God's word, turn with me to it. It comes from the book of James. I guess you know James was Jesus' brother. So uh, I can only imagine perhaps this word has trickled down from the lips of Jesus to James. And, or who knows, maybe it was Mama. Maybe Mama told him this. Hear now the word of God. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness. 
and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. Or if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they're like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. Let's hear that last line one more time. But being hearers who forget, but doers who act, doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. My friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears to hear your precious word. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you agree with me that we live in a loud and crazy world? All stinking time. We live in a loud and crazy world. This week I had the opportunity some might call the misfortune of spending three and a half hours in the Kansas City airport. Uh, any of y'all ever done that before? Not Kansas City, but DFW or Chicago O'Hare or Atlanta Hartsfield, you name it. You know, airports are interesting places, aren't they? I don't think that that's where we're at our best. <laughs> it did not take a huge scientific study to figure that out. All you have to do is turn on the television lately, right? We are not at our best because that is not when we are our calmest. So being mindful that I was going to be doing this sermon, I kind of paid extra attention to life, airport life. Airport life is a crazy kind of place. Um, I witnessed firsthand um, a spousal conversation that was at a heightened decibel level <laughs> as one spouse was leading the other spouse to the next gate because they were about to do what? Miss their flight. That's a joyful experience, isn't it? I heard uh, an employer chew out an employee because they were in the wrong spot at the wrong time. I heard all sorts of bells and whistles and um, alarms go off as a man accidentally went out the wrong door. Holy moly. Woo, you would think the nukes were about to go off. And then the precious children. <laughs> you know, when my granddaughters cry, it it doesn't upset me. I love them and I soothe them and, you know, they're just precious. But when your child screams at a very high level, I want to go to another terminal. And I pray, dear Lord, please don't let that child sit by me on the airplane. And God, in God's funny little sense of humor, had that child sit right in front of me all the way from Kansas City to DFW. God bless her. God bless her. And I just could do nothing but laugh. God, you are a funny God. You are a character. As if it weren't bad enough in this loud and crazy world, even the places we go to for peace and quiet are not peaceful or are not quiet any longer. I came across a study this week that's actually going on, and you might be a participant if you go to any of our national parks this summer because there's a crisis going on in our national parks, and it is caused by you and I and that thing that's either in your hand right now or your purse. What is it? Your cell phone. Because all of us think that our trip to the Grand Canyon is the most spectacular trip ever known to mankind. And we want to document the whole stinking thing. Every move we make, every ledge we step on, every moment. And we talk loud because that's what we do. We videotape every moment because, well, our trip is really all about what? Us. To the point that it is becoming such an irritant to everybody else in the national parks. The national park system is doing a study this year to how to figure out how to keep us from hurting ourselves by our own phones. We're crazy people. But at the end of the day, what is it that we really most want? I believe we want a safe and predictable world. We want a safe and predictable world. We want to know that our comings and our goings are safe. We want to know that the people who we choose to do life with are pretty consistent, are fair, are reasonable, and are rational. Another way to put that that was actually more truthful is we just want to be in control. Because this loud and crazy world has made us fearful that the world is what? Out of control. 
So the best way for us to retain control is to always be on. We have developed some coping mechanisms, or at least I know I certainly have. I am sure that Clay and Daniel can attest to this. Um, there are times when God, in God's just quirky little sense of humor, says, you know, I think I'm going to have you preach a sermon that you need to hear. <laughs> I don't know what God was thinking about that. But um, let me run through some of these uh, coping mechanisms that we have come up with. How many of us are the, uh, when we go to an event, we are the loudest person in the room? Anybody sitting by the loudest person in the room? <laughs> I heard a yes. And that is a way, Sharon, I'm sorry, they love you, but that is our way of staying large and in charge. And if we are large and in charge, we can kind of run the show, right? The other thing that some of us do, not that Sharon and I ever do this, but uh, instead of being the person that is loud, we are the person that never stops talking. Have you ever been to a dinner party with that person? They talk and 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 they talk. And every story they have to tell is all about what? Themselves. Do they ever ask you an inquiring question about, well, how's your life? If they do, they ask you just long enough to hear your answer politely and then bend the conversation, what? Back to themselves. I have never, ever been known to do that. But let me tell you all about the time that Daniel did. <laughs> the other thing we do, and... Um, I know if you are like me at all a TV news watcher that you have seen this enough that you want to throw a brick through the TV. That moment when uh, you're watching a little commentary and of course nowadays everybody's got an opinion about everything, right? And they over talk or talk over each other. You ever been out to dinner with the talk over? Like no matter what you have to say, they're going to say theirs first because if they don't say it quick enough and fast enough, you're not going to hear it. Check out this little video. It's, it will grate your nerves almost immediately. You can think of another thing to say. Oh, you can think of You're both talking over each other. You're both talking over each other, so I can't hear you. Go ahead, Senator. That's the way it works. Ah. Did y'all catch that last little, uh, that's the way it, what? That's the way it works. If I want to get my point in, what do I do? I don't listen to you. I just talk and talk. So what in the world does all this have to do with listening? What's well, the counter to it, isn't it? We live in a loud and crazy world, but we want a safe and predictable world. And we don't know better, but y'all, we, we do, really. We really do. We know that uh, we are polarizing our families and our relationships and our world by not listening to each other. Parents aren't listening to each other Kids aren't listening to their parents. Students aren't listening to their teacher. Government's not listening to the people. The people aren't listening to their neighbors. Their neighbors aren't li It just goes on and on and on. We have created a crazy, crazy cycle. And what I'm imagining this morning and, and hoping and praying is that we as followers can step into the role of being leaders and interact with our family and our friends and our neighbors in a new and different way. What is it Jesus said? Love your what? Neighbor as who? Do you, do you want to be listened to? Yeah. Do you listen to your neighbor? Or do you just make up? Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, I think this is really a big, big deal. I don't even know that it's as big a deal as, I mean, I think it's a bigger deal than we even make it. It is that thing which has caused us all to live in these little bitty bubbles, these little cocoons, neighborhoods with tall backyard fences. We come and we go, but we don't know anybody. What if, what if this morning, we stepped out and we took just a little risk and we explored what Jesus had to say about listening? What if we didn't even listen? What if we just read what Jesus said about doing life with other people? So we already know he says, love your neighbor. Um, do not be the person that casts the first stone, give love and care and kindness. Let me wrap up this morning with what I think are the four cornerstones of Jesus' listening skills. Develop a heart of humility, an attitude of curiosity, the strength of conviction, and the character of courage. 
Perhaps of all three of these, maybe the heart of humility could be the hardest for some of us. It is for those of us who think we know it all. Are you sitting by a know-it-all this morning? We're not aggressively know-it-alls. We're just kind of passively know-it-alls because we know we don't need to convince you that we know it all because we already know it all, right? Say with me out loud, I do not know it all. One more time. All right, it's now on tape and we have it preserved. What if we also acknowledge that in the past I have responded inappropriately to you? I have said things that hurt and wounded you that were not true. What if it started with an apology? You know, I have not been a good listener all the time in our relationship. And I'm sorry. What if our kids heard that from the mouths of their parents? What if marriages heard that from the mouths of an arrogant spouse? Because that really is, if you boil it down, we are know-it-alls, or we think we are. We kind of walk around puffed up thinking we know everything there is to know about everything. What about an attitude of curiosity? A friend of mine, Laura Sennett, shares this phrase often. I've been in a book study with her now for quite a while. She says when she's in an interaction with her kids or with somebody else and it's not going the way that she maybe thought it would be, she asks herself, what else could be true? What else? What don't I know? What else could be happening? Let me share with you a quick story from a friend of mine. His name is Lance. This little boy is Austin. Austin um, goes to elementary school, swipes his lunch card diligently every, every day, you know, uses his money in his lunch account. Lance had gone um, one week and stocked it up for a couple weeks. Two days later, he gets a call from the principal. The principal says, I don't know what's wrong, but Austin's... Uh, Lunch account's almost gone. Lance knows that Austin has a, a love like me for ice cream and is convinced that every day Austin is loading up on what? Ice cream. So the conversation that evening started with a little bit of an accusation. Austin, why in the world are you always buying ice cream at school? Austin dissolves into tears like many of us when we were in third grade would do as our dad jumps on us. Dad, I'm not. He goes, I don't want to hear about it anymore. I've told you, no ice cream at school. I'm not going to go load your lunch account anymore. He said, Dad, that's not what happened. He said, all right, tell me what happened. He said, Dad, two of my friends, they never have lunch money. And I think they come from a family that can't afford lunch. So you always say to look out for other friends. So I bought their lunch. Lance said, way to go, buddy. Way to go. Thanks for teaching your daddy a lesson. Strength of conviction, character of courage. Let's close on those two. Sometimes we don't listen because we don't want to hear the truth. Or we don't want to speak the truth. We need to combine those two. Conviction to the very core and courage to the very core. To listen to the hard truth. We who are all puffed up and think we know it all frequently have finished a story before the story is even written. We look at a person and we size them up by color, race, creed, education, language, and we know their story, don't we? We know we better lock the doors at the red light because we're in a bad neighborhood. We don't really know anything. We have made up half of that story just to make our world feel more in control. And what about at home? What if you, you didn't take any of this anywhere else but at home? How many of us short circuit conversations, relationships at home because we don't practice humility, curiosity, courage, or conviction. I'll close with one last little story. Uh, as many of you all know, I got remarried two years ago. And as part of the getting ready for that process, Wendy and I went through some premarital counseling and part of our issue was communication because Wendy was marrying a know-it-all um, and, you know, the, the therapist said, Mr. Meyer, you're going to need a little help with your know-it-all-ness. And um, I like, how many, how many know-it-alls are in the room? Raise your hands again. All right, let me just tell you all a little tip. In a relationship, when things start going south and you're a know-it-all, um, you need to shut up. 
And you need to sit down and you need to listen to the other side. And one of the things that Wendy and I have tried to practice is when we have what we call a hard conversation, y'all all know what that is, right? Um, our doctor had us sit by each other, hold each other's hands, be present. No TV, no laptop, no cell phone, nothing. In part, that was to stay connected. In part, was to fulfill a promise that we said to each other, I will always tell you the truth, and I will always hear the truth from you. Friends and family, what if we took that and applied that moment and all of these moments into our relationships? The stories we make up about our neighbors whose grass is so overgrown, little do we know that they've had a death in their family, and the last thing in the world they have the energy to go do is what? Mow the stinking grass. Friends, let's choose to use what we know from Christ to step into leading this world into a new and different way to listen, to throw out the sticks and stones. What do you say? Let's pray. Gracious God, we, uh, we think we're know-it-alls, or even Christian know-it-alls. But it's one thing to know it, it's another thing to live it. Forgive us, God. For all the times we say one thing but do another. Help us open our ears, open our hearts to you. Amen.